And good afternoon, everybody, and a big warm welcome to you all to this very special event. We are streaming live here from Melbourne, Australia, uh, on behalf of the Baha'i community of Darabin and the Baha'i community of San Francisco. Happy 12th day of Rezvan to you all. Uh, in just a moment, we'll be cutting live to San Francisco to a very familiar voice to many of us. Uh, Luke Slot, who will be conducting uh, tonight's program with some storytelling and some Baha'i writings and prayers uh, beautifully composed into music. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Luke, uh, he is a recording and performing artist from Ireland. Uh, he began playing music at a young age, learning the trumpet and guitar uh, from his father. He spent some time uh, studying uh, piano at the Royal Irish uh, Academy of Music. Uh, while still in high school, he was signed to Sony Music, uh, but later on set out on his own as an independent artist. Uh, at the age of 21, Luke discovered the Baha'i faith and began incorporating uh, Baha'i teachings into his music. Uh, he's toured extensively, giving concerts and music workshops in over 20 countries. He was here in, in Australia about three years ago. Uh, he's currently working on a new album in honor of the 100th anniversary of the passing of Abdul Baha. Uh, today, he'll be sharing with us a special program called Garden of Paradise uh, in celebration of the final day of the Festival of Rezvan. I personally have a, a, a very special connection to one of Luke's pieces, in particular, uh, Creating Me a Pure Heart. Uh, I pretty much sang it to my boy Milan uh, with my head up against my wife's belly every night until he was born with my, um, my kind of less than okay voice. Um, so I'm looking forward to today's program, as I'm sure you are all too. Um, please sit back, uh, enjoy, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, please make welcome Luke Slot. Over to you, mate. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Bobby, for the, the lovely introduction. I'm, I'm so delighted that we can connect and, and do this together. Happy Resvan to everybody. Happy 12th day of Resvan. Um, as Bobby mentioned, this is a, a really exciting intercontinental community collaboration. And so I really just want to express my thanks to the Baha'i community of Darabin in Melbourne, Australia, who are our, our virtual hosts today, uh, and also to the, uh, the Baha'i community of San Francisco, California, who are our physical hosts today and who have very, very kindly been sheltering me in their in their community. So um, it, I think it's so cool that that these different communities in different parts of the world can uh, connect and collaborate to to have this an event like this online. And I, I want to give a special thanks to Nason at Baha'i Blog for giving us a, a platform online uh, through which we can we can connect and and celebrate together and I, I really think that in in times of crisis it's it's more important than ever to have to have things that we can that we can celebrate and you know I, I, I don't know how you're all doing with the uh, with the sheltering in place but I've really been trying to draw my my attention every day to to the little things that I can I can celebrate you know just the, I think it's important to, to celebrate the small victories. Uh, on a daily on a daily basis, um, but today, of course, is an enormous uh, historical celebration. Uh, today is the twelfth day of of Resvan, this the festival of Resvan, which is the festival of paradise, uh, which is uh, really the 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 most um, significant and joyful Baha'i festival of the year, uh, because it it really is the celebration of. Of, uh, of this this 12 day period which marks the the really the 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 very moment that the Baha'i faith as an independent world faith began and uh, and so for the next uh, 50 to 60 minutes in in honor of the of the festival of Resvan uh, I'm going to share with you a selection of songs the words of which all come from the Baha'i sacred writings and I know that I've been I've been referring to this event as a concert, but because really it you know it takes the form of a concert. But I really hope that we can we can maybe think of this this event as something a little bit different. As I really hope that this can be like a space for us all to to um, to be together and to have a kind of a sort of a meditative, reflective experience. And uh, you know I hope that that the the 
the, the, the words that I'm going to sing and the music will will transmit to you, um, you know, a sense of joy and celebration. And uh, I think, you know, if by the end of this program, my, my hope for this program is, is that after, say, fifth, the next hour or so, if if you if you go away with a, a renewed sense of uh, of confidence that that even though we don't ha yet have a solution, a real solution to this pandemic, uh, I hope that this program will just give you a renewed sense of confidence that humanity has the capacity uh, and the ingenuity to 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 get through this and figure it out and uh, and that and that all will be okay on planet earth <laughs> um so just to begin i, I wanted to begin um I, I thought that it might it might just focus our minds um if i begin by singing a prayer uh, that is about a very specific subject uh so this prayer was was written by abdul baha who was the son of Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i Faith. And about a hundred years ago, Abdul Baha uh, came to America and he he uh, he wrote this prayer specifically for New York City. And uh, as as we're all aware, N New York has has, has been a, is a place that uh, has been hit, you know, extremely badly uh, by the virus. It's um, not only uh, one of the most badly hit places in America, it's one of the most badly hit uh, cities in the world. And so I thought it might just help us to, to focus our minds by, by uh, thinking of the, the people of New York who are, who are struggling um, so much at this time uh, through this pandemic. Um, but even though the, the, the words of this prayer are specific to New York City, they, they're also very relevant to Resvan because this prayer is really all about transformation. And I think that the festival of Resvan is really all about the theme of transformation, uh, particularly in the face of a crisis. Bless thou, O King of Kings, the city of New York. Cause the friends there to be kind to one another. Purify their souls, make their hearts to be free. Bless thou, O King of Kings, the city of New York. Cause the friends there to be kind to one another. Exhilarate their spirits and bestow celestial power and confirmation upon them. Establish there a heavenly realm so that the city of Baha may prosper and New York be favored with blessings from the Abha kingdom 
that this region may become like the all highest paradise and develop into a vineyard of God and be transformed into a heavenly orchard and a spiritual rose garden. Bless thou, O King of Kings, the city of New York. Bless thou, O King of Kings, the city of New York. Bless thou, O King of Kings, the city of New York. So you, you may have noticed that the, uh, the, the last few words of this prayer express this aspiration that for New York City to be, to be transformed into a spiritual rose garden. And, uh, you know, of course, the image of a rose garden immediately brings to mind the, the concept of, of, of beauty. But a spiritual rose garden adds this, this other dimension uh, of spiritual beauty and it even uh, perhaps even provokes a kind of a, a question well what is spiritual beauty and I wonder if maybe we could just take that question and we could just tuck it away in the back of our minds uh, and and just as we as we we can keep it there as we work our way through this program which is actually going to take the form of a story and I know that some of you will know this story and I hope you're happy to hear it again but for anybody who is not familiar with the, the story behind the Festival of Resvan, I hope that this will be, uh, you know, useful to just give you a little bit of the backstory and the historical context and, you know, what, what, what exactly it is that we're celebrating during this 12-day festival. So, just to begin this story, I, I, I want to I invite you all, wherever you are, in your, in your living rooms, in your bedrooms, at your, at your kitchen tables, I want to invite you to, to close your eyes and to just engage with your own imagination. And we're going to travel back in time. We're going to travel about 200 years, nearly 200 years, back in time to the 19th century. Uh, which really was one of the most exciting centuries in the history of human civilization. In the 19th century, the Western world was on the brink of a, of a technological revolution that was destined to forever change how human beings communicate with each other. Uh, and of course, this all began with the invention of the telegraph, which was subsequently uh, followed by the invention of the telephone and the television and uh, and then the the internet. And now here we all are connected through the internet and in, in from different parts of the world. Well, parallel to this spark of, of uh, world connecting uh, technology that was being ignited in the Western world. Another kind of revolution was was being ignited in the Middle Eastern world. And that was a kind of a spiritual revolution, uh, which was being led by a, a young man in Iran, uh, or Persia, as it was known at the time, who was who was teaching people that humanity as a whole was in fact entering a new stage, a distinct new stage in its history, not just technologically, but also spiritually. And he was teaching people that the, the ancient promises of the world's great religions were going to begin to be fulfilled in the 19th century. And the manner, he said, in, in which these 
ancient promises were going to be fulfilled was through the appearance of, of a great teacher, a great, uh, uh, that great promised one who is promised in, in the, the sacred books of the world. And, and uh, of course, this, this, uh, this promise of, of a, this expectation of a great figure, a great promised one who is to come in the future and, and, will, and is to, to bring about some, some great transformation in the world. This, this somewhat strangely is a promise that is actually shared by just about all of the great spiritual traditions of the world. And this young man in Persia called himself the Bab, which means the gate, as if he were like the gate to this promised one who was soon to appear. And the Bab whipped up a, this great whirlwind of excitement all over Persia. Thousands, tens of thousands of people began to listen to the Bab and to prepare themselves for the, the, the coming of this great promised one that he kept on talking about. And very quickly, the authorities in Persia became extremely threatened by the, the seemingly unstoppable influence that this young man was having, even though the, the Bab was... Uh, you know, he was only in his 20s, he had no worldly power or anything, but he was, he was just turning his nation upside down. And the authorities unleashed this great tidal wave of persecution against the Bab and his followers. And the Bab himself was publicly executed on the orders of the Shah, the, the king of Persia. And in the space of a few short years, over 20,000 people, men, women, children, anyone who had dared to listen to the message of the Bab, were ruthlessly slaughtered on the streets of Persia uh, in the mid-19th century. But until his last breath, the Bab remained utterly confident that he had accomplished his purpose. He had he had prepared the people and paved the way for the coming of the Promised One. And so I'd, I'd like to now sing some, some words that the Bab wrote uh, in which he, he, he gives to his followers uh, an aspiration, the highest aspiration, he said, that they could aim at. And that was to attain the presence of the Promised One and to hear his words, to hear his teachings, and to, to put those teachings into action in their lives. So this is called Wondrous Paradise. There is no paradise more wondrous there is no paradise more wondrous for any soul than to be exposed to God's manifestation in his day, to hear his verses and believe. no paradise more wondrous there is no paradise more wondrous for any soul than to be exposed to God's manifestation in his day to hear his verses and believe in them. There is 
no paradise more wondrous there is no paradise more wondrous to attain his presence which is not but the presence of God to sail upon the There is no paradise more wondrous. There is no paradise more wondrous for any soul than to be exposed to God's manifestation in his day. To hear his verses and believe in them. So this, uh, this technological revolution was kicking off in, in the Western world. And at the same time, this, this kind of spiritual revolution was happening in the, in the Middle Eastern world with this young man in Persia known as the Bab, the gate at the forefront of it. But the, the, the Bab had been publicly executed on the orders of the, the Shah. And we, to all outward appearances, his message seemed like a lost cause. Uh, it really, to, it appeared to any onlooker as if his whole life had, had come to an end in utter failure. Uh, his followers had, had been decimated by the thousands. Those who survived fell into a state of, of, of confusion and despair and chaos and some of them renounced their faith in the Bab, some of them went into hiding or fled in fear and some of them were were, um, were uh, uh, arrested and imprisoned and and eventually uh, expelled from their country, sent into exile never to return. And among this group of the Bab's followers who, who were who were banished from their homeland and exiled uh, was a family and in this family was a man a, a husband and a father who who from early on had, had had become one of the stoutest and most capable really fearless champions of the Bob's message and and who for that reason had on, on multiple occasions been beaten tortured imprisoned and now ultimately expelled from his homeland uh, and whose name was Baha'u'llah uh, uh, which is usually translated as the glory of God but for the purposes of our theme today and our, our question uh, this name Baha'u'llah is also sometimes translated as the splendor or beauty of God and the place to which Baha'u'llah and his family were exiled was the city of Baghdad in Iraq and Baghdad was was a city that at a certain point in its history it had really been kind of like the like the New York City of the Middle East it had been this incredibly vibrant 
center of, uh, of culture and the arts and commerce and innovation and, and uh, it really had been like a like a, a, a like like yeah like a, the New York of the Middle East at one point and even though in the 19th century it had, it, it had fallen it had kind of lost that vibrancy and it had fallen to fallen into a state of decline it was still a city in which Baha'u'llah and his family and the, and the other exiles could live in uh, really with with some degree of safety and of freedom and from the moment that he arrived in Baghdad all the while taking care of his family raising his young children and helping them to find their feet in this new life of exile Baha'u'llah began to take certain measures to revive the message of the Bab he insisted that the promise of the Bab would be fulfilled and that the people must not lose hope. And he became this great source of, of optimism and confidence for his fellow exiles. It was almost as if he, 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 he took the, 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 the wheel of a ship uh, whose captain had been killed and he began to steer that ship through the stormy weather and get it back on course. And part of the way in which he did that was through the, the power of, of the written word. From, from the moment of his arrival in Baghdad, he began to produce this seemingly overflowing stream of, of writings, of books and letters and prayers and poetry. And, and these writings had this um, incredibly empowering effect on the, the people who, who read them. They became his words became like these these kind of shining lights of of guidance for his fellow exiles they became almost like these these stars appearing in, in the darkness of the of the nighttime sky forming these like constellations that, that, that could help his fellow followers of the Bab navigate their way through this terrible storm of, of spiritual confusion and despair that, that they had found themselves in. So uh, I'd like to now sing some of these words that Baha'u'llah wrote, um, these words of, of guidance that he that he gave to his his companions to kind of help them recenter their spiritual lives. So th these words are from a, a, a short poetic verse uh, in which Baha'u'llah, he, he describes the human heart as a garden, specifically as a rose garden. And the, the rose that is planted in this, in this garden uh, of the human heart, uh, that rose, which of course is that symbol of beauty, um, he, he uses here as a symbol of love. And so this is called Garden of Thy Heart. the garden of thy heart plant no but the rose of love and from the nightingale of affection and desire loosen not thy Trade. 
So these words, these writings of this exiled follower of the Bab, Baha'u'llah, began to spread around, uh, really like wildfire, first around the city of Baghdad and then all over Iraq. And soon enough, these writings were spreading all over the Middle East, which at, at the time was largely under the rule of the Ottoman Empire, one of the biggest empires in the history of the world. And these writings began to, to um, exert an influence, uh, not only on the followers of the Bab, but, but, uh, but on society as a whole, uh, because Baha'u'llah was not merely reviving the, the, the broken spirit of his fellow exiles, he was involving himself fully in society around him. He was, he was, he was helping Muslims to, to, to become more devoted Muslims, Christians to become more devoted Christians, Jews to become more devoted Jews, and lo even local politicians in Baghdad were, were becoming fascinated by the, the changes that they were witnessing in their citizens. In fact, the, the, the governor of Baghdad himself became enamored by this, this so-called criminal that had been dumped in his city, d despised and rejected by his homeland. And over a period of 10 years, this steadily rising crescendo of public prestige began to surge around Baha'u'llah. People of every strata of life that you can imagine, uh, merchants, farmers, philosophers, poets, artists, politicians, even princes from, from around the empire, began to, to flock to Baghdad to witness how this city was just being electrified through the influence of this man who, who to, to everyone's knowledge, was, was not anything more than a humble follower of the Bab. And yet, he seemed through his actions in the city and the, 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 the creativity of his, of his writings, he seemed to be accomplishing what throughout recorded history had always seemed like the impossible task. He was uniting people who for thousands of years had seen each other as enemies. He was somehow changing their perception of each other. Um, for example, he was teaching people, say that, that, that say for example, when, when a Jew loves Moses, what they love is the spiritual beauty of Moses. When a Christian loves Jesus, what they love is the spiritual beauty of Jesus. When a Muslim loves Muhammad, what they love is the spiritual beauty of Muhammad. And the same goes for a Buddhist's love for the Buddha or a Hindu's love for Krishna. And just by orienting people's minds towards the spiritual beauty at the heart of all of the great religions of the world, 
he was creating harmony between the people. And uh, aside from this, he was also introducing uh, radical, really revolutionary new ideas into the society itself. For example, Baha'u'llah was, was uh, promoting the advancement of women's rights. He was insisting, he was fearlessly asserting uh, that, in his own words, that, that women and men have always been and will always be equal in the sight of God. He was also laying out how, how the economic problems of the world can be solved by addressing the underlying spiritual problems causing them. And he was insisting that, that both religion and science must go hand in hand in order for civilization to progress in a, in a healthy, uh, enlightened way. But above all, he was teaching people that humanity is one. And in, in, in practical terms, he was telling people, he said to the people that the well-being of mankind, its peace and security, are unattainable unless and until its unity is firmly established. So in, in sum, he was teaching people how to be united. And after 10 years of, of witnessing this, uh, of witnessing their, their, their city undergo this transformation, uh, the people of Baghdad in the year 1863 were struck by a devastating crisis. Uh, a decree arrived from the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, one of the most powerful and really despotic rulers of the world, uh, ordering that Baha'u'llah and his family were to be permanently removed from Baghdad and were to be summoned to the imperial court, the seat of the empire. And of course, for the, for the followers of the Bab, Nothing could have been more disastrous. The Bab had been killed, the Promised One had not yet appeared, and their companion, Baha'u'llah, through, through, um, really through his vitality, his proactivity, the, and the, 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 the power of his mind, had become their, their, their one last hope. And so for the people of Baghdad, the removal of Baha'u'llah was really the removal of hope. But as the people of Baghdad were, were despairingly counting down the days to his imminent expulsion from their city, Baha'u'llah remained in a, in a state of total composure. He continued to, to, uh, to, to, to write, to teach, to spend time with the poor, the sick, with anybody who was grappling with a, with a problem that they couldn't solve. And he... he he assured the people that when the time was right, the promised one would appear. And he called on them to have patience in the face of this crisis. And so uh, on, the, on the subject of, of patience in times of crisis, I want to I wanna sing uh, an, another, another passage from the writings of Baha'u'llah. And I, I usually sing this piece with my sister-in-law, Diane. It's actually written as a duet. Um, but so I'm going to I'm going to sing a slightly altered version of it uh, just so that I can sing it on my own. But if you if you know this piece, um, feel free to sing along uh, from your home if you like. It still works. But I'd like to actually dedicate this piece to Diane and her family, because um, sadly, Diane's father uh, passed away very suddenly just last last week. Uh, and so I'd like to dedicate this to. Diane and her sister Sandy and their mother Susan and their deeply loved father Badia. This is called The Sign of Love. Oh, son of man. For everything There is a sign The sign of love Is for The 
sign of love is patience under my decree Son of man, for everything there is a sign, the sign of love. And so this great crisis, the removal, the forced removal of Baha'u'llah from their midst, uh, broke the hearts of the people of Baghdad. It, it shattered their hopes. It, it seemed as if the very fabric that was holding their society together was, was unraveling. But there was something, there was something deeper going on uh, that was at the root of, of their heartbreak, uh, something beyond any concern for, for social stability or, or civil harmony. There was something, something deeply personal had, had taken hold of their hearts and, and now that something was, was being torn away from them. And I, I think that what happened was, was something like this. You know, you know if you meet some, someone who becomes to you a source of wisdom and of warmth and understanding. Someone who who sees you clearly enough to to see the truth of you and and who who honors the truth of you. You you probably like that person. And if that person offers to you helpful insights about how how you might navigate through the the the, the whatever whatever difficulties your life throws at you you probably like that person a little bit more and if that person actually brings out all of the best parts of you and helps you to to become a better person you will probably want to spend as much time as you possibly can in the presence of that person. And so I'd like to just actually read for you a short passage which describes um, a little bit about the experience of the, the people of Baghdad 
during the time when Baha'u'llah was living as an exile amongst them. This is from God Passes By by Shoghi Effendi. Many and moving are the testimonies of bystanders who were privileged to gaze on his countenance or overhear his remarks as he moved through the lanes and streets of the city, of the mendicant, the sick, the aged, and the unfortunate whom he succoured, healed, supported, and comforted, of the merchant, the artisan, and the shopkeeper who waited on him and supplied his daily needs, of his adversaries who were confounded or disarmed by the power of his utterance and the warmth of his love. So intoxicated were those who had quaffed from the cup of Baha'u'llah's presence that in their eyes the palaces of kings appeared more ephemeral than a spider's web. Uh, one prince who, who came to Baghdad and visited Baha'u'llah several times remarked, I know not how to explain it, were all the sorrows of the world to be crowded into my heart. They would, I feel, all vanish when in the presence of Baha'u'llah. It is as if I had entered paradise itself. So all of his uh, social teachings aside, all, all of his, his beautiful poetic writings aside, it was actually the, the, the personal effect that Baha'u'llah had had on the individual lives of the, the people of Baghdad that was really the, the real cause of their heartbreak at the prospect of his departure. In, in fact, w one government minister in Baghdad was so saddened by what was happening and felt so powerless before the, the decree of the Sultan that he, he decided to provide for Baha'u'llah a, 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 a large space, an open air, outdoor space uh, in the city so that Baha'u'llah could have a proper space in which the people of the city could could come and, and say goodbye to him. And that space was a beautiful, finely cultivated rose garden on an island in the river that runs through Baghdad. And that garden is known today as the Garden of Rezvan, the Garden of Paradise. And so on the day when the day arrived for Baha'u'llah's departure from the, from the city, uh, crowds gathered in his neighborhood. Um, people were climbing up on, on the rooftops around his house just to get one last glimpse of, of him as he stepped out of his door for the last time. Children were, were running up to him, crying, pulling at his clothes, begging him not to leave. And Baha'u'llah mounted his horse and he, he, he told the people that he was, he was entrusting into their hands the well-being of their city and he urged them to take care of each other. And as he rode out through the city, he invited all the people to, to come and visit with him over the following 12 days in the Garden of Rezvan. And when he arrived in the garden, you can, you can imagine, you know, how this garden must have been. It was some... Um, you know, it was, it was late April, it was the height of spring, the, the, the roses would have been in full blossom, the, you know, the, the lawns were probably the most vibrant, rich green, and you could hear the, the singing of the nightingales uh, amidst the roses. And when Baha'u'llah arrived in the garden, he and his companions uh, pitched a tent. And for the following 12 days, he lived in this garden so that the people could come and say one last goodbye to him. But on the first of these 12 days, Baha'u'llah did something which, like, like an alchemical reaction, transmuted the, the, the heartbreak of, his, of the people into uncontainable joy. He, he gathered his friends around him in the garden and he revealed to them a secret that he had been keeping all his life, a secret that many of his friends had, had silently started to guess. He told them that he was in fact the one 
that the Bab had had promised, uh, the one for whom all of the religions of the world had been waiting for thousands and thousands of years. He was the promised one and they didn't have to wait any longer. And he told them that he was going to deliver to the world a new message which would, which would provide humanity with the tools necessary to, to establish universal peace and to bring humanity together as one united family. And so uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to now uh, sing uh, some, a, a passage from the writings of Baha'u'llah in which, in which he describes the, the, the character of the, the really extraordinary um, new phase in history in which we all now live. Uh, this is called, This is the Day. So in this rose garden, the Garden of Resvan, Baha'u'llah revealed to his friends 
uh, but he was the one, the promised one, foretold by the Bab. And over the following 12 days, the people of Baghdad came in waves to uh, not only to say goodbye to him, but to experience this this transformation of their of their their heartbreak into into celebration and joy. And uh, on the twelfth day, Baha'u'llah once again mounted his horse and prepared to leave Baghdad with a, an entire caravan um, of horses and companions and uh, government escorts uh, and his his uh, his departure was was uh, almost royal in its uh, in its in its character the uh, the governor of Baghdad himself um, wanted to ensure that Baha'u'llah would would leave Baghdad um, in a way that would that would honor the um, the contributions he had made to their society, and he he arranged f for in every that in every in every stop that Baha'u'llah would make along the way on his journey to the the capital of the Ottoman Empire, uh, that he would be received with with respect and with with dignity, and so on that twelfth day of Resvan, that day which we are celebrating today. Um, we can we can look back over those ten years in which Baha'u'llah had brought about this transformation um, among the the followers of Baghdad. He he had he had arrived in their city as a criminal, and through the really through the the power of his of his lo love and warmth, he had won their hearts, and he left like a king, <laughs> and that's the day that we're celebrating today. The, the 12th and final day of Resvan. But of course, the, as I mentioned at the beginning, the whole story of Resvan, it's, it's really the, the, the story of that, that very beginning moment uh, in which the, the Baha'i faith began, uh, which is uh, described as the declaration of Baha'u'llah, which took place in those 12 days in the garden. And so really the, the, the whole story of Resvan is, is, is really just the opening chapter of a much bigger story, a story that, that bursts out of the initial scene of Baghdad and the garden and, uh, and actually encompasses a huge number of different people and different countries and different cultures and, uh, and eventually reaches all the way to the most powerful kings and queens and presidents and prime ministers of the world, both in the East and in the West. Uh, but uh, that story is beyond the scope of today's program. So I'd like to just finish this uh, story of Resvan with one last song. But be before I do, uh, I wanted to just uh, return to that initial question that I, I brought up uh, at the beginning. That question, uh, what is spiritual beauty? And, you know, just it, it, in my preparations for this program and in just thinking about the the deeper meaning and significance of Resvan, I, uh, I, I came to the conclusion that, that uh, the person who is spiritually beautiful is that person who brings out the spiritual beauty in the people around them. And that is exactly what Baha'u'llah had done for the people of Baghdad. He had taught them, first of all, he had taught them to see themselves as noble and valuable and, and um, as worthy of respect, worthy of being treated with dignity. He had taught them to, to have faith, n not only in God, but to have faith in humanity and to regard every human being, in, in his words, as, as a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. But most importantly of all, he had, he had guided people back to the most important part of their own selves, their heart. And I think that in doing that, he showed us the essence of spiritual beauty. And so, 
I'd like to bring our Resvan story to a close with uh, with one. I'd like to read one quotation, and then sing one last prayer that was written by Baha'u'llah uh, during his years of exile about the heart. God has given man a heart and the heart must have some attachment. We have proved that nothing is completely worthy of our heart's devotion save reality for all else is destined to perish. Therefore the heart is never at rest and never finds real joy and happiness until it attaches itself to the eternal. How foolish the bird that builds its nest in a tree that may perish when it could build its nest in an ever-verdant garden of paradise. up 
comfortable essence bring me joy oh thou who art the most manifest of the manifest and the most hidden of the hidden the most manifest of the manifest and the most hidden of the hidden of the So that brings us to the end of our story of Resvan. So uh, thank you all so much for watching and, um, and thank you again to, the, uh, to our hosts, to the Darabin, the Baha'i community of Darabin in Melbourne, Australia, and the Baha'i community of San Francisco, California, and of course to Baha'i Blog for, for hosting us. So, um, so thank you all and I will hand it back over to uh, to our MC Bobby. So, thank you, Bobby. Luke, thank you so much for that. That was uh, beautiful, mate. On behalf of the Baha'i uh, community of Darabin, San Francisco, and everyone watching here tonight, thank you for um, for your beautiful program. It was uh, absolutely. Um, uh, wonderful to listen to. So thank you. Um, look, as mentioned at the beginning, um, Luke is currently working on a new album in honour of the 100th anniversary of the passing of Abdul Baha, um, which will be commemorated in uh, 2021. So if you'd like to support the making of this new album, uh, you could do so through his Patreon page. Um, supporting him uh, that way will help him continue his work. So you could learn more about it at uh, P A T R E O N dot com forward slash Luke Slot. Um, I've asked Luke to kind of stick around um, if that's okay, mate. Still, um, a few people have sent through some questions, and um, look, uh, look, I'll just fire them off at you, and if you kind of um, you know see how you go with them. So, um, one that's come through is, uh, can you tell us about your creative process? Uh, how you find inspiration? And do you have any tips for people who are setting uh, the Baha'i writings to music? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. I, I uh, you know, I, I think that that's something that I think about a lot. And it's, uh, you know, there's it's still uh, something of a, a bit of a mystery to me. I think a creative process is something that you can never really quite put your finger on. But um, I think that, you know, I, I think that something I think about a lot is is um, the idea of, of getting oneself into like a, a, a position um, where one can receive inspiration and I think part, you know part of just getting into that position is is to do with you know like uh, hard work and craft and and uh, you know um, practice and you know being being trying to develop a kind of a 
a discipline and a structure and, and um, you know, minimizing distractions. And so I think that sometimes I think about a creative process in two ways that in, in on the one hand, there is this, I think there's a necessity for that, you know, structure and discipline and, you know, going, going to the work, going to like the desk or the, your instrument or whatever it is. And then, um, you know, at the same time being open to like, um, the, the, uh, the, the unexpected whims of inspiration. And actually sometimes, you know, they, they work very closely together and, you know, developing some kind of pattern of work, I find it can, it can, it can leave you open to uh, inspiration and new ideas that can come and and um, you know in some ways I think that part of like you know practicing your instrument and uh, developing your craft whatever it might be in some ways that's about like uh, g getting out of the way so that you know ideas can can flow through without too much without too many obstacles um, so I think that you know for anyone anyone who is who is um, doing creative work um, you know particularly if you're if you're setting the writings to music and you're maybe you're um, you know you're interested in in that kind of that dimension of it I think you know the more you do it the better um, you know if you develop some kind of structure and routine for for for, um, for that kind of work I think that's very good and then I think also the other side of it is that that kind of um, um, openness and you know, I think it's really important to pay attention to what speaks to you. Um, you know, if, if sometimes people people ask me, you know, how do I choose what what writings to set to music? And you know, I I, I try to just pay attention to what speaks to me. If something, you know, if I'm reading something and and um, uh, I, I try to I try to pay attention to like if something sort of is on the page standing out to me is that like oh that's that's a cool sentence or that's a, you know that that that's just resonating with me and then and then I'll, I'll let that sort of float around in my head for a while and feel around the rhythm of that sentence and then and then um you know later on pick up the guitar or sit at the piano and and um you know often it starts with just improvising just fiddling around and then you know out of that fiddling um an idea will come and then it takes a bit of time to just sort of carve it into shape and you know it often takes several drafts but um that and that's again that you know that process of work that comes in so you know i think there's the, there's the, those two things for me at least in my process there are those those two elements of like you know um structured work um and craft and also just you know paying attention to the things that inspire you and going to those things and you know really embracing them and and um you know i think you know that that one element that that is really important in in a creative process is that an element of play you know i think that's very important you know it's good to have the work it's important to have the work but also like to kind of have that element of play as well and i think when they combine um I think you know there can be great results um, when when work and play combine together. That can be a really wonderful thing. So, but as I said, this is you know it's a mysterious process that I'm always trying to I'm always trying to figure out, and I'm not sure if there's ever uh, it's not I'm not sure if it's something that you can just put your finger on. But I hope you know I hope that that's helpful for for others who are who are doing similar work. So thanks. Look, that's excellent. I think um, that sort of advice is excellent for anyone that wants to put uh, Baha'i writings into music. May I've got another one for you. Um, what inspired you to combine your music with storytelling? I think that uh, I think that storytelling is uh, is an important craft. I mean, you know, like growing up in Ireland, storytelling was is like it's embedded in the culture. Music and storytelling are two like really really important aspects of Irish culture um, and I know that's true of that's true of many cultures around the world but you know growing up it was storytelling was something of, of great um, importance and um, and I think that part of the reason why storytelling is 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 uh, is important and perhaps is becoming more and more important in society is is that um, a story can um, you know 
a story can can carry like multiple levels of, of 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 information and communication you know if you have just a list of facts maybe the, that list of facts will kind of can, will go in one ear and out the other but i think a story storytelling is important because it uh it can actually engage a person's imagination like the actual the listener or reader of the story their imagination gets engaged and i think when your imagination is engaged um, it's almost like something can get kind of burned into it, you know, it can get, it can go in at a deeper level. And I think with a story, you know, it, um, there's something about a story that is, it's kind of almost archetypal because, you know, every human being is, is living out a story. So the whole concept of a story is something that is universal and relatable and powerful. And so I think when, when, um, you know, each of our lives is a story. And so I think that, that that's perhaps one reason why it's a, it's a powerful vehicle for communication because it, um, it, it reflects the reality of every individual's experience of life. Um, so, uh, so that's why I think it's, it's, a, it's an important tool and I think it's, it's a great craft to, um, to develop. I mean, I, I consider myself very much a, a student of storytelling uh, again i don't quite i don't quite know the the uh you know i couldn't really spell out all the ingredients of a good story but in in terms of my own um practice of storytelling you know i i try to i try to go with what feels right um you know and 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 sort of feel where there are certain climaxes in a story and and you know work my way towards those moments and um you know it's something that i definitely want to develop and uh i hope that it's it's a it's a craft that uh more and more people um will develop because i think we're bombarded with so much information these days that it's it's hard to to uh focus our minds uh, on on one thing and i think storytelling can be really beneficial both telling stories and also hearing stories or reading stories is a, a, a great way to focus the mind and um, I think that is uh, that's something that is becoming more and more important in uh, the fast-paced world that we that we now live in yeah a uh, great response Luke. look look I, I completely agree with you on um you know the importance of storytelling and how powerful the role of storytelling plays in engaging one's imagination um mate i've got another one for you um uh it says what do you think resvan represents today so uh what does resvan represent today so i i i think i really do think that as i said at the beginning uh you know resvan from a certain perspective is is all about transformation because it was it was an event that transformed uh this huge crisis uh into this victory uh, and it transformed this um this atmosphere of heartbreak into an atmosphere of celebration and joy and i think that you know obviously we're going through one of the greatest crises in human history right now we're all experiencing this together and i think that resvan can uh, the story of resvan can can it can it can give us hope that a crisis can be transformed and that humanity has the capacity and the and the ingenuity and the genius and the brilliance to work its way through a crisis to find a solution and transform ourselves um i, I think that you know, throughout history, we have seen uh, human beings transform and change themselves. And um, that often takes place as a result of going through a crisis and coming through it um, renewed and changed on the other end. So um, perhaps, the, perhaps the bigger the crisis, the bigger the, the change. Um, but I think that Resvan can remind us that um, a crisis can be changed into a victory. I think it's a, it's an important reminder in today's world. And um, yeah, what an important reminder it is. Um, 
Look, I've got one final question for you, Luke. Uh, it says, when are you coming back to Australia? Anytime soon, mate? <laughs> Uh, I, I, as as soon as I can, you know. I I, uh, I I last year, I had such a wonderful time uh, touring Australia. It was just one of the highlights of my year. Was uh, coming to Australia and uh, visiting the communities there and making new friends and getting to know getting to know you all. Um, it was. I just had such a blast and. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I would love to come back. Maybe as soon as we are through the this uh, this crisis, um, maybe we can open up up that door. And I would be absolutely honoured to come to Australia again. And uh, you know, it was it felt like the it felt like it was too short last time. I think it was there for about three weeks, but um, it felt too short. And I would love to come back and maybe stay for. A longer time, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, spend a bit more time in each in each city. Um, but of course, um, Melbourne was uh, was my last stop on that tour. So it's so so lovely to be able to reconnect with with Melbourne through this event. And um, yeah, my my thanks again to the 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 Darabin community in Melbourne for 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 reaching out and and getting this this all started and for hosting this event in uh, in connection with San Francisco and and Baha'i Blog. So, um, so yes, I, I, I certainly hope to come back to Australia as, as soon as I can. So thank you. That's great, mate. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you with open arms. Um, look, uh, that's all we've got time for today. Luke, on behalf of everyone here today, uh, thank you for the beautiful program. Um, a special shout out to Shantani, Meridad and Nissan from Baha'i Blog for helping puzzling this together. Um, guys, uh, stay happy, stay safe in these kind of un, uh, kind of somewhat isolating times. Uh, and until then, uh, happy Resvan and um, take care.